Freud said there are no accidents, Mark Gerstein might agree with him. Mark Gerstein is the author of Flirting with Disaster, how all the things that we call accidents may in fact have a chain of predictable events before them that if anybody had taken them seriously and taken the opportunity to divert the course of events, the accidents might not have happened. Everything from Chernobyl, the Challenger and Columbia explosions to the Enron disaster and Katrina in his book. Mr. Gerstein, thanks for joining me. Great pleasure to be here, Pat. So, so really, the, as I read the book, there was this feeling of, of helplessness, like someone, oh, I was thinking of Kevin McCarthy and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, screaming, they're coming, they're coming, and nobody's listening. I think that uh, I certainly had that feeling as I was building up these cases. It's a, it's a terrifying feeling, and it, it does link so well to your last series of guests talking about the need to effectively scare people into paying attention to something and and you know you have to you have to feel that that in the in the bioterrorism world um, and even the sort of mother nature aspect of the same phenomenon it's better off we're better off being scared uh, there's there's almost uh, and and you talk about some of the the mythology in your book but here unsubstantiated intuition Trump's inconclusive analysis for most people. This was an incident you wrote about. So even if you present evidence to people that if you do A and B and C, then D is going to happen, there's something in our nature that makes us say, well, but what if it doesn't? Well, that's that's absolutely right. I think that, that uh, denial is an amazing characteristic of the human mind. I think we have an almost infinite capacity to just not believe the things that we don't want to believe for whatever reason. And certainly in cases like uh, Hurricane Katrina, which may have been the best predicted um, accident in American history, um, with virtually everybody up and down the line saying, um, I don't, you know, this is, this is going to be terrible, the likelihood is very high, we have to do something about it, even then, people didn't do what was needed uh, in sufficient time. Uh, let's just, without detailing them, let's just run through the, the, the circumstances, the events in your book that you characterize as events that were not accidents but could have been foreseen and, and dealt with. You mentioned Katrina. Uh, you mentioned the, the Challenger and Columbia explosions. What else that we think of as accidents ranks up there? Well, one of them, and it links uh, back to a discussion you had earlier in the program, is the subprime crisis. There have been a series of, of large-scale economic disasters that have come down the, down the road, including the East uh, Asian monetary crisis from a few years ago, the meltdown of long-term capital management, um, and so forth. And the subprime crisis, when you begin to unpack what actually happened, was that uh, nobody really knew what was going to happen if subprime lending and CDO-style products, these very exotic derivatives that were built in uh, a very unusual and counterintuitive way, uh, became a significant part of the American and then global financial system. Uh, Alan Greenspan was worried about it. The head of the New York Fed was worried about it. Lots of people were worried about it, and yet nothing was really done. And the mess that we're in is in many ways of our own making. You write that the problem is that people are tempted by short-term gains or coerced by social pressure, and then their risky behavior is strongly reinforced when they repeatedly get away with it without incident. So people again and again and again can do risky and dangerous things, and when they still come up fine, they say, hey, we don't need to worry about protections or insurance or guarantees or precautions. Well, and beyond that, which I think is, you know, sort of all the justification or, or analysis that we need, in many cases, the people who create the problem get out more or less scot-free and sometimes with enormous profits. Many of the people who were selling the, the CDO mortgage-backed products made fortunes during that period. I mean, we tend to concentrate on a few companies that have that have not done very well, but large numbers of individuals who are selling those products made absolute fortunes, and were incented therefore to do it um, as long as they sort of got out of dodge before things uh, completely collapsed. 
Mark Gerstein is my guest. He's the author of Flirting with Disaster. If you'd like to talk to him, give us a call at 866-893-5722. You can also blog on the subject. Go to kpcc.org and click on the Pat Morrison blog, and there you'll find your opportunity to weigh in on this as well. Um, we'll, we'll come back for some more substantial discussion about the specifics, but I'd like to ask you about the cost-benefit rationales that go into this. People say, yes, we can do this and avoid disaster, but it's going to be expensive. We could all wear helmets and seat belts in our cars and all have airbags and drive 20 miles an hour. What are the cost-benefit justifications and rationales that you see playing into creating what we think of as accidents, but in fact you see as inevitable? One of the, uh, one of the most important ideas to unravel these, these mysteries is to look at um, who would have to pay to prevent them or to significantly reduce the cost versus who pays if things go wrong. So if we think about um, Katrina, for example, which is a, a good illustration, it would have been the local governments, local taxpayers in New Orleans, uh, the state government and so forth, who would have had to shoulder enormous expense to protect the, their city because the federal government had basically said, we're only going to give so much for, for protection. Um, however, when, when Katrina came through the city and largely obliterated it, large numbers of individuals um, paid the price. Small businesses paid the price. And it, economists call that an externality. Okay. The people who have to pay to fix it are not necessarily the people who have to pay when it breaks. More examples of what are not accidents, but perhaps inevitabilities that, if well thought out, could have been avoided when we come back. This is 89.3 KPCC. I'm Pat Morrison. How often do we use the term accident, and how often is something really an accident? Or how often is it the consequence of us not paying attention or choosing not to pay attention to the evidence that leads us there? Mark Gerstein is the author of Flirting with Disaster, Why Accidents Are Rarely Accidental. If you'd like to talk to him, you can call us at 866-893-5722. You can also blog on the subject at the KPCC website. Go to the Pat Morrison blog. Uh, Mr. Gerstein, let's start with, with the one I think most people people would think of as most obvious because the investigation was so public, and that was the Challenger explosion in 1986. Again, the accident, the Challenger exploded, but but we found out pretty well that it wasn't an accident, that it was something that people had actually predicted. Well, it was predicted in two ways, uh, both of which I think are very important for this discussion. One is that the, the, the rocket boosters that push the shuttle off the launching pad were not the most reliable technologies in the world. Uh, they were derived from an earlier rocket, the, the Titan Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, and had a failure rate of about 1 in 100, and since there were two boosters, that would have made it a failure rate of 1 in 50. Turns out, I think, uh, as a coincidence, more than a prediction that it was on the 50th launch that Challenger blew up. So somebody should have actually just done the arithmetic to figure it out that the risks were greater than NASA was admitting. NASA's sort of internal figures said that the risks were well into the thousands. The second thing is that the, the rocket maker experts on the particular part of the problem that eventually uh, did in the Challenger, the O-ring rubber seals that hold the rocket booster together, uh, that had a long history of problems, and there were some very worried engineers, both in general. They couldn't get the money to, and the resources to actually research it as well as they might. But the night before the launch, they made a pretty big fuss, and they were overruled by their own management and by NASA. And one of the great mysteries that uh, people have been asking questions about for a long time is, why did they have to launch that day, that time, when there were so many important people that said maybe it wasn't a good idea? And did you have any insights into why that was, why we would have thwarted the chain of evidence with one of these uh, optimistic leaps that you describe in your book? Well, you know, the 
the, uh, Richard C. Cook, in a, who was uh, one of the original whistleblowers about about Challenger, and uh, who wrote, I think, an important history of of the accident, places the blame uh, with President Reagan, who who d- either directly or indirectly let it be known that he wanted to use uh, the teacher in space, Krista McCullough, as his hero at the. Uh, at the State of the Union address that was taking place during that uh, the period that the spacecraft was going to be in orbit. Now there is no definitive proof about this, and Reagan did deny it. So I don't think anybody really knows what the truth is. But we are left with the problem of why NASA would have pushed so hard, why there were so many phone calls back and forth between NASA and the White House uh, on that particular day and why they didn't just postpone it to the afternoon uh, as the engineers mm-hmm. had requested to wait for the spacecraft to warm up. And we don't really have answers to those. Mr. Gerstein, how do you define a true accident? Well, I think a true accident is something that could not have been predicted, that really came out of the blue, that was a statistical anomaly for which there had been no warning or warnings that were well outside of the the opportunities that existed um, to do something about it. And um, there aren't that many of those. As unlikely as many of these events are, uh, we're generally uh, smart enough to catch most things. There there are certainly some things where there are unknown unknowns, but there's a relatively uh, small number of them that we actually see, although by definition, since they're unknown, we don't know what we don't know. Let's see if we can apply this this system, uh, this analysis to you know, just being at home. For example, if I needed to clean pine needles out of the eaves, out of the gutters, and I put up a ladder, and it, you know it wasn't exactly sitting evenly, but I just figure I'm just going up the ladder for a minute. You know, it'll be fine. Is this the same kind of risk benefit analysis that we bring to knowledge plus a kind of gambling that creates things that we call accidents. Well, I think absolutely. Um, most people would say, "Well, I couldn't have known that the earth underneath the ladder was not as strong as I thought it was. Um, it might have been a good idea to have somebody hold the ladder while I was going up on it, but my wife was making dinner and my son was going to pick his sister up at the movies, and you know, and on and on and on. So I wanted to get it done." And, those are the kinds of rationalizations that we generate all the time about why we do risky things. Now, what we what we believe, um, even though it probably is not true, is that when there are important factors uh, at risk, and you know there are the fate of cities and you know rockets into space and so forth, that leaders um, make smarter decisions than that. Uh, the evidence is that people are pretty much the same, and they make the same kinds of rationalizations and foolish and take the same foolish risks as everybody else does. Mark Gerstein is the author of Flirting with Disaster, Why Accidents Are Rarely Accidental. If you'd like to talk to him, give us a call here at 866-893-5722, or you can go to kpcc.org and click on the Pat Morrison blog and blog away on that subject. Nima is calling from Long Beach. Nima, thanks for your call. Hello. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, I have a uh, kind of a comment as to as as to what uh, Mark uh, was talking about is the the fact that people are ignorant about the hard facts that they see. I like to know about uh, the facts that uh, people see about the economy, and by the people I am talking about, the, um, the actual people living in the country or the the government itself. Um, what does he make of that? Uh, the fact that we are ignoring real hard facts, um, the recession, um, whatever it is ahead of us, and we're not doing anything about it. Uh, because he's been talking about the past events, I'd like to know what he thinks of the future. Okay. Mark Gerstein? Well, I think the one of the most difficult things about the current economic situation, which is a um, I think a surprise to a lot of people is that a lot of what we believed about the global economy um, turns out not to be true. Um, for example, we believed that uh, spreading risk around the world would uh, make the probabilities that horrible things would happen to the economy in individual countries lower. 
turns out that isn't true at all. As the subprime crisis I- illustrates, we have a global slowdown precipitated by thing, events primarily in the United States, and that happens to be something that nobody really expected. So I think um, I think there's an economic consensus that we're going into a very tough period, and that we're going into a tough period uh, worldwide. What I don't what I don't know, and certainly what nobody else knows, is how deep it is going to be and how long it's going to last. Thanks very much for your call, Nima. Uh, Helen is calling from Burbank. Helen, go ahead. Hi. I wonder if you have any suggestions on how to talk to your boyfriend or husband who may be delusional about, delusional about the risks that they're taking with their future finances. My boyfriend is 40, and he seems to think that he's going to earn the same amount when he's 60 as he does now. And I just don't think he's planning for the future, but whenever I try to talk to him about it, he thinks I'm paranoid. Well, wow. Mark Gerstein, you you have a chapter called Paranoid, or at least part of it called Paranoid Optimism. Well, I think that people, um, when they are younger, and, uh, definitely have v- very rosy views of the future, and it's very natural to assume that things will c- continue in the future as they have done in the past. Uh, the I think one of the most useful things that that you can do in talking to your boyfriend is to help him understand the enormous power of compound interest because if you save money on a regular basis and keep it in the bank for a long, long time, the amount of money that you make in the long run is enormous. And if you postpone your saving until later in life, you will find that you end up with a surprising amount less. And I would say that some good financial planning and a, and a spreadsheet and a realistic conversation would be very helpful. Helena, good luck to you. Um, Mark Gerstein, it occurs to me as you describe some of these things, the idea that what we call accidents really are preceded by a chain of events that may have allowed us to predict what was coming and it wasn't an accident at all. How much of, of a sort of evolutionary function is there in this? When you're 16 years old, you think you're invulnerable and you take risks that you wouldn't take when you're 36 years old, or even a soldier thinking that, you know, yes, there's a lot of gunfire out there, but I'm not going to be the one to get shot. There's there's got to be something besides the, the the logic or the illogic of it that's at work here. I think that's right. I I'm not exactly sure what the evolutionary utility is of being naive about risks, but I think that that if you think about the kinds of things that young people needed to do in terms of exploration, um, hunting, going on long treks and returning. I think there was great biological uh, and evolutionary return in risk taking at a young age, um, and most of the wisdom you know that that people have as they go into their forties, fifties, and sixties, uh, which comes from long term accumulated experience, those ages are not m- of much uh, relevance in evolutionary terms since people didn't live that long, and evolution mostly cares about only that period up through the end of of, uh, child rearing. So I think that we are actually dealing with a modern phenomenon rather than an evolutionary one. One of the most interesting cases you give in the book is an example of uh, a series of misfortunes that could have been foreseen and somehow forestalled is what happened with Easter Island. This is the island in the South Pacific with you know, the huge stone statues, a culture that was dedicated to, in a sense, a stone statue race. The bigger they were and the more you put up, the more status you had in the culture. What happened to Easter Island to make it deserted and empty, and what could the Easter Islanders have seen coming with that? Well, Easter Island is, for me and for lots of other people, a sort of, you know, example of like a pure case of a warning about our evolutionary future. The short version of the story was that in this statue race that you just mentioned, they more or less deforested the island. They had to cut down trees to build roads to transport the statues. They had to create logs and sleds to move them from one place to another and so on and so forth. And in that process, they more or less ignored what was happening to the habitat as a result of of their obsession. And they dest- when they took down the trees, they took down the bark that they needed. They destroyed the habitat of birds that they fed on. They eliminated wood they needed to heat their fires in the winter and so on and so forth. And eventually, they destroyed their society from within. Uh, 
I think a difference between the Eastern Ireland uh, civilization many thousands of years ago and the one we live in today is they didn't have the analytical and planning tools to be able to figure out what they were doing to themselves. Uh, we do, but we are still capable of being as naive as they were about the application of those tools, and even when people show us the results, <laughs> in many cases we ignore them. Let's see. Richard is calling from Pasadena with an observation. Richard, go ahead. Oh, good afternoon. I just wanted to point out that uh, this term car accident seems like an oxymoron because I think the vast majority of car accidents could have been avoided. Mark, well, there was an inter there's an interesting study that was done a couple of years ago in Virginia where they actually videoed, videoed um car accidents by putting uh, video recorders in a large number of passenger cars and just watching every moment that people drove. And what they discovered when they did that is a bunch of things that no one ever knew before about where accidents come from. And some of them were things like people falling asleep at the wheel during the day, which is something that no one ever realized uh, occurred at all, and that probably might not be as easily fixable as, as one might hope for. But they also discovered that people did uh, just a large number of f incredibly foolish things. I mean, they, we all know about talking on the cell phone, but it turns out to be amazingly dangerous. But people do things automatically so that they have a cup of coffee and they, they sort of, it's going to spill. They tend to chase the coffee instead of watching the road in front of them. And if papers slide off the seat, they try and prevent them from doing that and in the process move the wheel and will move the car into the car next to them and so forth. And once you know that, which is new information, you can begin to retrain yourself and also not do things that are dangerous, like drink coffee when you're driving and put papers on the seat next to you because you think you might want to look at them during a, during a red light. Richard, thanks so much for your call. Um, we've got a minute or so left, and I'd, I'd like to ask you how much of this do you think is really the benefit of hindsight? Hindsight, we know that the Challenger and the Columbia blew up. We know that Arthur Anderson Accounting Firm went down. Is this a case of a forensic reconstruction, or do you see enough of a pattern that you can tell people, look, this is what you can look for and see what's going to be the consequence of it if you don't stop it? I believe that we can really make a difference in doing this. I think in the book in particular, I talk about what individuals can do, what they can do in their organizational lives, what leaders can do, and so forth. I think we, we know a lot more than we've ever known about how to think about these problems and what to do to prevent them. The difficulty is that a lot of this, uh, particularly in an organizational setting, is extremely hard to do. Why is that? Mean. Why is it so hard? Well, the, the simple answer is because the rewards lie elsewhere. Um, hierarchical organizations um, create environments in which people do better if they keep the, in their place and not question the authority of the people that they work for. And when you speak out, particularly if it's an inconvenient truth, the organizations try and punish you. And that's a hard thing to fight against. Are, are we not just structured as a high-risk, high-reward society and, and mistakes or, or loss of life even are considered just a cost of doing business? Um, I think that's the rationalization for it, um, but it very much depends on whose life it is. And most of us are very concerned about our own lives and those of the people that we love. So I don't think that people believe that at all, except when it's people far away and, and, that, and that they don't know. Sounds like you can go back to the crossing guard lesson, look both ways and look both ways again before you cross. Is It's just a, a very simple approach to keeping bad things, which you characterize as, we characterize as accidents, from taking place. I think that's good advice, as simple as it sounds. It's still very hard to do. <laughs> We're just not programmed for it. Not at all. Mark Gerstein is the author of Flirting with Disaster, Why Accidents Are Rarely Accidental, from the Space Shuttle Explosions to Katrina to Chernobyl to Easter Island. If you'd like to blog about this, go to the KPCC website and have at it. We'd love to hear from you. And my thanks to Mark Gersten for joining us today. I'm Pat Morrison. As I said, you can go to the KPCC website to blog on this or other subjects we've talked about today. We always want to hear from you and read your comments as well. Thanks very much for listening. This is 89.3 KPCC, Southern California Public Radio.